Hi, my name is Rick Adams, and I'm really pleased to be here today uh, with a group. And we are talking about this question. What are the important implications for the customer success profession in 2021, particularly through the lens of NRR or net revenue retention? So uh, joining me today, I have a fantastic team, so I will let them introduce themselves starting from the top. Yeah, good morning. Or good day, everyone. I'm Miranda Dekonski, Senior Vice President of Customer Success and People at Swiftly. Hey, everybody. Glad to be here. I'm Jeff Brunsbach, the Director of Customer Experience at HireLogic. And hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be here as well. I'm Peter Armley. I'm Senior Director of Customer Success Strategy and Enablement at Oracle. And as I've already said, my name is Rick Adams. I'm actually the CEO and founder at PracticalCSM.com. So, um, Fantastic team, uh, both broad and deep, I feel, um, and three people that I already know and get on very well with, which makes it great for me. So I'm really looking forward to this uh, session. So uh, without further ado, let's dive into it. Now, what I've done is I've divided this into four sections. The first one's going to be really brief, which is just making sure that we're all clear what net revenue retention actually is. And we're going to get through that as quickly as possible. And then we're going to get into the proper conversation around how do we drive greater NRR, the impact of focusing on NRR on the customer success profession, and also how that fits then in terms of wider corporate strategy and what the business is trying to achieve as an entire uh, corporate organization. So without further ado, let's get stuck in. So the first one is what is NRR? And all I want to do is just very briefly explain it and make sure that everybody else on the panel agrees. So what is NRR? NRR is the ratio of total recurring revenues from existing customers in the current period compared with the previous period. So that could be monthly, quarterly, annual, depends how you have your contracts, but let's say it's monthly. So every month you're basically checking to see, are we going up or down compared with last month, but just from existing customers. And that's important to note. So it takes into account the contracts we didn't renew, i.e. churn, the contracts we renewed but went down, the downgrades, the ones that renewed but went up, which is you could describe as an upsell, and also anything new that we have sold to existing customers, which we could describe, as you see there, as a cross-sell. And this is the formula. So uh, A plus B minus C divided by A. So A is our previous period uh, revenues. Uh, we add to that anything else that we've sold. We subtract anything that we didn't get to sell. And then we divide by the original number A. And then we always express that as a percentage because NRR is, is a ratio. So we're going to get a number that's going to be something like 0 0.87 or 0 0.115 or, or, sorry, or 1.15, for example. So that'd be 87% or 100. 15%, for example. So here's an example. Let's say we sold $120,000 uh, last month. Let's say that we lost $25,000 in complete churn. We lost those contracts. We went down by $12,000 in downgraded renewals, but we won $55,000 in upsells, so we had more, and $17,000 in new sales to existing customers. Plus, maybe we also won some new business, net new, from new customers as well, in this case, $25,000. So what does that all add up to? Well, here's our A's, B's, and C's that I've worked it out, and I'll just put the formula back on so you can see how that works. So A is our $120,000, plus whatever else we increase by, which was 55 Five and 17 so that's what 72 and then uh take away the churn and the downgrades which is 32 so we've got 120 plus 55 plus 17 minus 25 plus 12 and then divide that by 120 and as it happens our example is 1.29 blah 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 which is 129 percent so that is an example of how we calculate nrr is everyone happy with that or does anyone dispute that before we move <laughs> forward? I, I, I think our jobs would be a lot easier if, if our uh, net, net revenue retention was 129%, uh, you know, month over month or year over year. That would make, I think, Peter, Miranda, my, my life a lot easier. We'd be doing okay. If we could do that on a monthly basis, we'd be doing all right by the end of the year, wouldn't we? Just on this section, then, one simple question for the panel. Why is this a useful figure? What What is it that makes this valuable? Why do we bother calculating it, please? Yeah, it, it kind of tells the story of what your customers are doing and where your revenue is. NRR is incredibly important. 
Um, if, if you are not at least 100% or above, you have a major leaky bucket. Um, but when I talk about NRR to my team, I, I tell them it's just a data point. It's an important data point. But if your churn is high and you're chasing churn and you have high NRR, um, you, you have still have a big problem. Um, but NRR is definitely one of the metrics that we use all the time. I, I just see it as um, as a really great um, metric for holding teams accountable for paying close attention uh, to the activities and the, and the rhythm of their engagements. Um, that that how important uh, all their intersections interactions are uh, with customers and and to be really mindful that this number uh, is is really critical on an ongoing basis because of the, just the nature of cloud and SaaS. Yeah, I was gonna add that last point that Peter was talking about. You know, I think in the recurring revenue world that we're all all moving towards, right? We need to make sure that we're retaining as much revenue as possible, and then we're expanding the current customers because, um, you know, that's how our revenue and our um, that's how our uh, business is going to be valued over uh, a period of time. You know, when you start thinking about valuations with SaaS companies, and so um, yeah, becomes you know kind of echoing Miranda and Peter it becomes a really great tool to help understand what our customers are currently doing today, where we have some gaps and need to make sure uh, we're filling that in. And so um, definitely something that, you know, uh, leaders in the company are looking at on a regular basis to try and help inform some of the strategies that we're doing. Great point. Um, spoken like a true business owner, uh, you know, this is what our investors want to see is they want, they want to see consistency. And this is, this is a con consistency of value being created before we get out of bed. Uh, from, from renewals is so important this is what this is this is one, one of the aspects of the holy grail of a of a SaaS business without a doubt so thank you for that all right that's great okay so look, let's talk about the things we're meant to be talking about today they haven't got having got that bit out of the way of, of, of making sure that we're all comfortable what it is Let, let's let's talk about uh, what we're going to do about it so the, the first section I've I've titled driving greater nrr and in fact uh, we we met uh, a few days ago and we came up with some sort of questions to ask uh, ourselves uh, during the session and and these are those so let's just walk, walk through them see how far we get let's start with the top one so in what ways does customer success need to change or adapt in order for nrr to increase any thoughts yeah, so uh, first and foremost, uh, one of the ways customer success needs to adapt and change is stop thinking in uh, transactional ways, uh, in ways of um, being very reactive and thinking about what problems am I solving today. So they need to be very strategic with their customers and be thinking in outcomes and return on investment. Um, NRR is, as I said a few minutes ago or a few seconds ago, it's just a, a data point, but it's an important data point that we can impact heavily. If we are being strong partners with our customers, it helps us reduce churn, increase expansion revenue, upsell opportunities, and renewals. Um, if your product is not driving value, especially now more so than ever, um, when companies are looking at their bottom line, you could end up on the chopping block. Um, so customer success really owns that, making sure that their products do not end up on the chopping block per se or cut from the budget. So it, it sounds like what you're saying, Miranda, at least, at least partially, is if we want NRR to sort of go up and stay up, We've got to think more long term and more strategically. It's not like net new sales that come in and, well, that's great and we'll celebrate it and that's that and move on. It's actually it's more about consistency and it's, it's more about developing long term value for customers so that they continue to renew rather than worrying about this renewal. Am I right in my assumption? Yes, there? you're hitting it. You're hitting it spot on. Um, so if you're thinking about customer success as emotion these days, we have to be guardians of the current revenue, but also you know, create a relationship or an environment where we can expand. Um, it's not enough anymore to just get that monthly uh, subscription amount from your customers. You have to grow it as well. A lot of companies are in a land and expand motion, and that's where customer success can really be power players. Peter, any thoughts? I guess I don't want to necessarily add on to Miranda said, I agree, I agree completely. I guess I would add another dimension around leadership. I think um, 
you know, to play it off of Miranda's comment about um, thinking strategically, absolutely, 100%, you have to do this. And that's, that's really going to address kind of the systemic kind of improvements you need to make as an individual CSM, or right, the way you engage with your accounts. Uh, through a plan. Um, but I, I think of NRR too as, as an opportunity for managers. Uh, let's talk about managers of CSMs to, to really up level the way they um, coach uh, people and CSMs in particular around how you can become better guided guides for your customers um, to really fit into that more strategic kind of um, approach. Uh, I'll call it because I think without um, without that sort of ongoing coaching, I think CSMs kind of struggle to kind of retain the big picture, and that's really the manager's job is to layer on that um, longer term um, uh, rigor uh, around how an organization kind of continually programmatically work with customers to really systematically address the, the causes of of churn. Um, and really affect that NRR number. I think uh, I just want to focus in on that manager le level. That's really interesting. So it sounds to me like what you're saying is if we want if we want bigger picture results, we've got to do bigger picture thinking. Yes. Uh, and that's not necessarily going to come naturally from the team unless we guide, coach, mentor, and an assistant to understand that that is what we want. And I and I'm thinking here, and and Jeff, I don't know if you want to dive in as well on this. Is actually that also means that we've got to make sure that we're not forcing them into the short-term results and giving them the ability to create those long-term opportunities is it, would you agree with that yeah definitely i mean i think you know when we look at nrr as well it's really a lagging indicator right for us um in terms of the, the the way that we can use it as a tool like miranda mentioned earlier right it is kind of one tool in our tool set it's very important for the business and so i think the the, the other thing that comes to mind kind of expanding on what peter mentioned in terms of the other dimension right is how are you helping your teams understand how they're impacting uh, NRR, right? So if you have teams that are delivering customer success, that's uh, managers that are different than implementation, that might be different than support, uh, different professional services, right? You have different kind of teams that that now are sitting underneath the customer organization, and they're all impacting that net revenue retention. And so it's it's really helping. Can we help those managers of those teams identify the leading indicators? What are the things that their teams are doing? What are the activities that we're putting on their plates? Um, and are we seeing how that can actually drive and impact that net revenue retention? So I think, you know, are we reinforcing the good good behaviors or reinforcing the activities that are driving value for our customers? And then ultimately, to your point as well, are we aligning our incentives to make sure that that our teams are understanding that you know the big picture is that net revenue retention? Um, and so we're not uh, we're not kind of creating incentives that maybe are different than our our business objectives, right? And that's where I think we've seen some clash before as well. What one of the things that we can perhaps use is marketing. So what are, as it says there, what, what are the ways where a greater reliance on modern marketing methods might help us to uh, accelerate NRR? I'll, I'll, uh, I'll jump in on this one first. I've, this is where I've, I've been spending a bulk of my time recently, just as uh, you know, leading customer experiences, thinking about this on a regular basis. You know, how, do we, um, how do we kind of break through the noise, which is kind of the next question. I think these, these two questions are, are similar. You know, is how are we breaking through the noise and really developing the relationships uh, like Miranda and Peter mentioned you know, that get just beyond the transactional element. Um, so a couple of things that I think we've been we've been thinking um, a lot about recently is um, how, how are we actually writing? I think the um, the art of like writing a good email and if, you know, and the art of kind of the, how are we crafting content, blogs, uh, things that are relevant for our customers and tapping into the customer voice, you know, and really trying right. to make sure that we're talking about things that they understand that are in their terms, um, that we're really speaking to them as, as kind of the personas um, as the leaders of their organizations. Um, so I think that has been a, a big part of time for us. Um, and I think the second area is just how do we get better at holding digital events? I think we've all been in the Zoom fatigue and um, we've all sat on, you know, uh, conferences or webinars or, or things. And, you know, uh, are there are we really driving, you know, great kind of retention on that call or on that um, specific series that we're driving? And so how do we create engaging sessions? How do we make sure it's run in a really consistent manner? How do we take content maybe from events and virtual sessions we're holding and then kind of cross pollinate it maybe into a community or into blog or marketing. But I think there's just this, um, this idea right now of how are we making sure that um, content in the organization is really speaking to the customer and that it's kind of being leveraged across all different types of channels um, as well. So a great deal of time being spent, I think, in a lot of organizations right now about how does marketing customer success really forge a good relationship to make sure that that's happening on a regular basis. 
Wow, there's just so many points in there, Jeff. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, and and, and I, I think one thing that I particularly picked up on, I just couldn't agree more with, is, is the language that we use and the things that we focus on because uh, it's so easy because we are who we are. And obviously we're thinking about the things that we're thinking about. We're thinking about the things that impact us. It's natural for us then to express those, but actually that's not necessarily what's of interest to the customer. So taking that moment to think, yes, but you know, A, what's relevant to the customer and B, in what way should I express that that makes it important and makes it makes sense and uses the language that they use i think is really important and makes such a difference to developing a common understanding and a trust and a confidence that the customer will have in us that we are on board with them we're not expecting them to get on board with us in order to you know drive sales of our product we're getting on board with them in order to drive value for them i think that's so important right and i like to kind of layer Onto that, I mean, the way I think of marketing uh, in the context of customer success is, is kind of like three, three elements. Uh, I would say, you know, CSMs need to understand how to market to customers based on where they are. They have, they have close proximity to customers. So the industry should understand where they are in their journey and what pieces of content would be most relevant to help them in, that, in those moments and maybe the moment ahead and can I lead them forward through content uh, dist distribution. Um, but then more at a, at a broader programmatic level, I would say it's smart to for customer success organizations to aggregate kind of the learnings from all that stuff and develop best practices, but also improve your own ability to kind of distribute content uh, or, or push content for the CSMs to understand how to deliver it. Um, and then finally, I think uh, customer success organizations need to understand how it all fits into the broader theme of what the company is meant is trying to do. What what kind of face are they trying to present to the market, and and how does this all fit into the brand? I think it needs to complement the brand. So we talk about CSM being very professional, and really, and Jeff made a fantastic point about professional communications, and really, how do you craft all that kind of stuff? That needs to be really well thought out. I think to fit into the bigger theme of what is what is Oracle trying to present to the market in terms of a, a kind of a corporate kind of image? It's it's a tough one, but I think it needs to be a factor in this. So we need a we need a joined up approach by the sound of things, and I, yeah. and I think also not not just joined up in terms of well we both agree this is the type of language we're going to use or we both agree yeah you know, this is this is the look and feel of our marketing collateral, but also quite literally you know a joined up campaign as it were. Yeah. where you know whatever's being done elsewhere in the organization is, is complementary to and we in turn in cs are, are complementary to whatever else is happening you know elsewhere within our organization that, that is currently talking to or or touching upon the customer so that the message is is um a, a holistic one rather than yes. you know, different different point messages from different parts of the business and I, I agree with everything that's been said here. So I come from a smaller startup, um, but it's B2B enterprise, um, fairly large contracts. Uh, last year we did end our NRR at 116%. We're just wrapping up our NPN, NPS period and we're in the lower 70s, which very proud of. I really believe that the high NRR and the overall high sentiment scores um, come from us being very aligned across the organization with how we communicate with the customer and what messages we will put out and we won't put out. I wouldn't say I act as a guardian, but I act as a partner with the head of marketing and making sure that we're not sending out just a spray and pray marketing methods, um, that we're being very thoughtful and mindful in how we're marketing, who we're marketing to. We're actually taking into account the overall state of the customer health if we are trying to do any type of targeting for expansion. Um, and we're not just sending it out. Uh, if they have had a bad experience or, you know, and, and I know this isn't incredibly scalable, but we're at the size right now where this still makes sense. So if they have had any kind of bad experience or we know that there's something that they're struggling with on the current uh, product suite, we're not going out and trying to sell them more, right? So we've been very thoughtful about that and it's served us well so far. Um, and we're actually starting to look at account-based marketing and how we can do that very specialized marketing touch across the entire portfolio. 
That's very interesting. So yay, yay to a strategic joined up customer success marketing plan, <laughs> right? And and B, yay to let, let's look at a customer as, as, as being a, you know, a unique and individual unit of requirement who's in a, in a current position themselves and also in a current position within the engagement with, with ourselves as well. And, and let's respond accordingly. I know it's all great. Better move on. How do you make the case to add resources? What's the right formula to show what's needed to support NRR? I don't always want to be the first person to talk, but I'll, I'll speak up here. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> it, okay, so what's the right formula? It's going to depend on your company and your product. I know nobody likes that answer. It depends. But um, what, I, what I have historically done is shown how much revenue is actually driven from the customer success org, rather, whether it's directly or indirectly. Um, I built a business case um, at a couple of companies ago that showed um, that accounts that were managed by a CSM had like something like 4X the upsells compared to those that were not. I ran a whole control project that showed that. And it just spoke for itself. That 4X was significant in right. revenue. Um, so, you know, that right there, if you can figure out what the story is that you need for your company to show what the actual output of CS is beyond the NPS, beyond the sentiment metrics, but really drill into the revenue metrics, it builds it, it builds the business case for you. So look, financials are so important to to any business. It's how you know at the end of the day, you know we're all we're all there to, to make ultimately to make a profit. Generally, in in early days, perhaps perhaps growth is more important than profitability, even. But but effectively, whether it's growth or whether it's profitability, it's revenues, and 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 that's really critical to the business. You know, the business is not going to survive without them. So so getting to that bottom line and and, and proving the bottom line in financial terms is how you drive a business leader right absolutely you have to yeah, figure the, out what the other is, stuff is nice to have yeah very much so but you have to figure out what is the language that is being spoken by the person that holds the purse strings and put it in that language so they they understand what they're going to get for their investment yeah, I don't know what else to. I don't know what else to add. I mean, it's, you know, I think it was full full answer. There. <laughs> um, other than to say, I think the the, the key thing to remember is um, the financial metrics are you can't do without that. You have to have that. Um, and and then basically a story. I think Miranda used the word story. I think that that those elements together are are we're going to launch the ability in a much bigger way to be successful in making that business case. I think um, because there's so much noise. Uh, in in the leaders, the executives, uh, heads these days around business, they need to. If you really want to call attention to something, you have to be able to kind of tell a story, but with financial um, backing and supporting uh, proof that this is going to make a difference, and and you can kind of paint that picture that they can believe in. I think so too, and I think with NRR, obviously it's a ratio, as we said earlier. So yeah. you know, it, it's either 0.79 or 1.13 or whatever it is. Yeah, you know, expressed as a percentage, sure, but basically it's a ratio, um, and that still leaves a little bit of work that needs to be done by the dear old CFO. So, so to, to help them out, having having worked out the ratio, which is of value, very much of value to ourselves, and should be a value to them as well, uh, and and of great interest to them, because as we said, it's proving consistency. It, it's showing the direction of travel, right? Well, that's great. The direction of travel is one thing, but how fast are we going? It doesn't show that. So, so that is where we then also provide the money. So, so, so the two combined, if, if you imagine like the, the speed and the direction of travel tells you twice as much as just the direction of travel. Are we trudging along or are we racing along? Okay. And, and that, that could move the, the needle, if you, if you like, from customer success being a, yeah, it's okay, to being a really exciting part of the business for, for the for the C-level execs. Jeff, any thoughts from you? Yeah, I was going to add a couple, maybe just the, the things that um, I've experienced in a couple of situations before. I think, you know, don't assume, question everything, right? A, a budget is just, is just that, right? It's a, an, an estimation for the year. It's something that is malleable. It, it changes, right? Theoretically, like throughout the year as you're going, you're uh, it's adjusting. And so I think sometimes, you know, when you're an individual contributor, you think when they say, hey, you know, 
the budget is X, you think, oh, okay, well, that's the budget for the year. And really it's, you know, there's uh, kind of nipping and tucking in every part department, right? There's priorities that come up just to Miranda's point too. There's a business case that comes and, and if you can make the, the right story, you can make the right business case. I mean, they're going to go find the money or they're going to make the investment um, because of that. So I think just making sure to understand, hey, you know, we can go make a, make a case if it's compelling, if there's a good story behind it, if we've got the right data, um, then we can go do something. I think, you know, something that Peter mentioned that resonated a lot too is making sure to forge the right relationship in finance, right? So um, the CFO has a team, typically, depending on how big the organization, right, they're going to have a team that's working with them. And so who's the right to make, um, you know, go start understanding some of their processes a little bit better, start understanding the language that they use. Um, and then, you know, forging that is really going to become beneficial when you go into that process of saying, hey, what's the business case? Because you can kind of bounce it off that person pretty early on and say, hey, I'm, I'm putting together this business case. I'm using some of these metrics. Here's some of the assumptions that I'm making. Um, you know, how does this sound? Is it is it moving in the right direction? I think that becomes really critical for your your process that you're going through. Um, and I think right. the part too is just um, what Miranda mentioned as well, which is understanding that I think maybe the one question or the number one question in the industry, right, is like, how many CSMs should I have per revenue or how many CSMs can handle X amount of accounts? And, you know, I think that just drives me up a wall because I think that's so situational when you start thinking about it, you know, you just need to have so many more metrics and data behind it uh, at your organization to understand, um, you know, what, what the right and uh, number looks like. And it's not going to be something that's across the industry saying, Hey, we, all you need is a you know, one CSM per hundred accounts. Like that's just, I don't think we're ever going to be, be at that point. Um, and so I think just making sure to take everything with a grain of salt, you know, go ask your colleagues, go ask your, your friends in the space, you know, what are they seeing? Uh, what type of ratios do they have uh, can be helpful, but also just use it as a, uh, use it critically, use it as a guidepost a little bit more. Yeah. So uh, those are a couple of things maybe I'll just, just add on to there. Um, so Jeff, I couldn't agree more. Let, let's focus on the interesting, exciting, broad strategic visionary questions, not the dull operational ones when we're talking to the sea level. Um, and um, as, as Peter, as you, as you were saying, and I think, you know, Miranda, you were alluding to, is is that to do that we, we need to sort of excite them with the figures and the statistics we're showing we need to build the right relationships with those people so that so that we've got a conversation going we need to understand their world we know what their challenges are what their motivations are what they are being targeted on um by the vcs or the you know by the investors whoever they are uh, you know what pressures they are under and how we may be able to help them so that when we build a business case it's a business case that's tailored to help meet their problems and their challenges and, and, and to help, you know, overcome the hurdles that they have and, and bring the opportunities to the business that the business is actually looking for. So we're, we're effectively, we're aligning to the direction that the company is going in. So does anyone have any final thought or shall we move on? Is that okay? Or does anyone want to say anything else? All good. Okay. So let's move on to the impact on the customer success function. And uh, let's start with the top question there. And, and maybe, Jeff, if I can pick on you to, to kick off on this one. How will the dynamic between sales and customer success change over time? Yeah, we're going to give Miranda a break from her, uh, from, from leading. Uh, you know, we'll, we won't be as shy going forward, Miranda. Uh, but I think the, maybe the big thing that Peter hit on earlier, right, is, um, you know, the dynamic that we have, uh, have to think about long-term relationships now. You know, we need to be considerate about what are we selling customers um, is it the right solution at the right time? You know, obviously we want to maximize as many dollars as possible, but, you know, I think um, the recurring revenue model doesn't necessarily mean we have to maximize uh, all the dollars on day one, right? Um, and so I think, you know, customer success, that's really how we need to hold our, our sales counterparts uh, accountable is, you know, are we selling the right solution to the right, right company, to the right person at the right time? And then, you know, that gives us the opportunity to kind of look at the roadway ahead and say, okay, how are we going to make sure that they're successful if they've currently purchased? And then, you know, getting back to what Miranda talked about in terms of, uh, you know, some of the great successes that they've had in terms of net revenue retention is how can we then steadily expand them over time and make sure that they're receiving more value from additional products, additional services we might have. But I just think, um, you know, making sure that customer success can hold this sales team accountable in some ways. Um, and so again, you know, quick way or an easy way is to start thinking about how do you have, do you have the right relationship with the sales leader in that part of the organization you know, do they have certain pipeline meetings that they're uh, they're going into? Is there a role that we can play into that? You know, and I think um, a lot of times there's a narrative that customer success wants to shut down deals right there. I think we've kind of gotten that narrative sometimes where it's like, hey, you know, customer success doesn't always want to get the deal closed. And I think maybe reframing that a little bit to say, hey, you know, we, we want to try and maximize as much business as possible, but we want it to be the right situation because, again, we're going to be inheriting that customer. It's going to be a nice, smooth transition. 
Um, and if we're, we're expected to take that customer, you know, to that next renewal or to that next moment of value, uh, we need to make sure that those things are really consistent, tight and concrete. And um, I think that's just where we need to make sure we can hold, hold sales accountable during that time. Yeah, so uh, that was a great uh, answer. Jeff, uh, really good insights. Uh, and I would, I would say that um, I think the dynamic will continue to, to improve, meaning I already see demonstrations of, of good kind of better partnership between sales and customer success. And this is something we, many of us for the last 20 years have been advocating for. So it's gratifying to see actually progress on that front. But I would say too, that um, I think customer success needs to go move beyond that. This is what we need from sales. And, and to tie into what kind of Jeff is alluding to, to say, this is what we can provide to sales um, through our ongoing intel of working with customers in, in real environments with the solutions and driving value and what the lessons we're learning that we can then turn around and help you become better salespeople um, for not just the accounts we're working in to grow, but actually for new logos too. So I think there's a real opportunity to expand the partnership between sales and customer success. And it's going to be primarily driven through, through data, um, real examples of success uh, that's, that's empirically kind of showing through, through um, success plans and customer testimonials and all that kind of stuff. And then customer success needs to step up and just really double down on creating the stories around those things that they can not just feed into the marketing engine that that talks about customer references to the broader community but actually internally push those back into sales and say this is what we've learned um, and this will help you uh, to be better at, at selling but there is a difference isn't there between a sale this month and a sale that will be renewed because it's the right sale That's right. will carry on being renewed yeah. for the next 12, 24, 45, 373 months. And that's what customer success the difference between the value proposition. You know, winning, winning a sale and w winning a relationship, as it were, you yeah. know, and really helping the customer. So yeah. I think I think actually that we 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 can say in customer success, look it is time that we need to sort of stand up a little bit for ourselves and, and go back to, to sales and say, yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, r revenues right now are important. Of course they are. And, and, and of course you want your commissions and of course you deserve them. But at the same time, you know, we are here for the building the long-term uh, relationship with this customer. And we'll, we'll maybe talk about this in, in the final section. You know, what, what we really want to talk about is, you know, it's the net, the net value of a customer, the lifetime value of the customer is what's the most exciting thing from our perspective as a customer success manager. So NRR is our route to that, that CLV, that customer lifetime value. So how do we drive it if we're not making the right sales? We've got to make the right sales, not just sales. I think it's really important. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Rick. And I will also just add one more component. I think where I have historically seen the most friction between sales and customer success and organizations is when they're not aligned around the right goals. Um, and there should be a little bit of friction uh, you know, between these departments, but not so much so to where it's at a detriment of the customer experience or the company being successful. So I think, you know, making sure that you have the right company level goals, and there's also accountability built into those goals to where customer success doesn't have to be that police officer of the, you know, is this a good customer, bad fit and all of that, like take that ownership out of the customer success realm and, and put it at a company level. It helps reduce that friction. Which of course, if you have your reporting into the same person can be easier to achieve potentially maybe now. Yeah? I, I am a big advocate for um, customer success leaders and sales leaders, and you know, yes, to report directly into maybe the CEO, but I am not a fan of a CS leader reporting into a sales leader. Just a big conflict and in interest, in my my humble opinion. My, my I, I don't have humble opinions, but I totally agree with you. I, I have opinions, always willing to be proven wrong. But incidentally, <laughs> in fact, that's how we grow, right? um but there's no humility in me whatsoever so so but i still agree with you totally agree with you totally agree with you if 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 sales is leading 
you know the the discussion and sales 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 can always play its trump card at any time right they can play the joker and then the game's over you know so so uh, you know you know you know when they're the 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 boy whose football it is has to go home for tea well then we all have to stop playing football in the field now because because we don't have a football anymore if the guy's gone home with it so (laughs) we don't want that situation so i think questions one and two are basically the same i think we just re we just came up with 12 questions and two of them happen to be you know pretty much the same so i think let's move to question three are there any fears of cs being turned into sales i think we're kind of we're kind of touching on that already so uh jeff any thoughts oh i took my mic off go ahead jeff i was gonna say my uh my short answer is no (laughs) um you know i think i don't necessarily see a big fear of, of cs turning into sales but i think you know, the, the big question or the overarching element, I think, is your growing and scaling and customer success team is, you know, do you have the right team to have the right conversations? And so are we going to be talking about contract renewals? Are we talking about upsells and cross sells? And, you know, is my team equipped to do that? Have I, you know, have we provided the right kind of training elements and educational elements to help them feel confident in those discussions? You know, are they, are they comfortable talking about money and, and contractual language and the things that come along with that, right? Because that's it's something that's just not um, probably not natural to any person, right? You need to learn that. You need to go through those experiences. You need to have some formal training. And so I think the the big question to me is just, you know, how, how are you making sure that you're putting your teams in, into um, successful situations? And, you know, as you grow and scale, I think like we've all talked about, you know, there's different teams that um, start to form. And so, you know, who's, who's handling that renewal, the upsell, cross-sell discussions, and making sure that there's a clear kind of racy type matrix um, you know, who's responsible, who's accountable for those situations. Um, because again, I think at the end of the day, you want to make sure that you're driving value for the customer and that you're delivering the right outcomes. Um, and, you know, maybe splitting up that role so that kind of the, the contract negotiations move over to a different person to uh, maybe shelter, you know, your CSM to make sure that they're, they're looked at as a strategic thought partner or a strategic value for the customer. And so I think, again, your business and uh, kind of the metrics that you have are going to probably drive a lot of those decisions like we've talked about, but um, I don't have a fear of it turning into sales. I think the other thing, the last point that I would mention too, to kind of follow up on what Peter mentioned is um, really taking charge of, of being in the customer organization and saying, Hey, we're seeing who's successful on our platform. We can kind of help refine the, the ideal client profile, right? When, when sales and marketing are coming up with that ideal client profile, so to speak, right They're, I mean, they're making assumptions. They're looking into the market and saying, here's where we think the solution fits best. But now the customer organization is the one who's working intimately with those customers. And so, you know, do we have the right persona? Is it the right organization? Um, is it the right industry? Do they have the right, you know, employee size that we need or revenue size? Like all of those things can really help uh, in a nice way. But I think, um, you know, how do you package that up and tell the story back to the sales organization becomes a big, big element of that as well. Thank, it, thank you, Jeff. Miranda, you wanted to say something. I yeah, I, I agree with everything Jeff said, except the, the first statement. I do have a fear of seeing CS being turned into sales. And I think every leader over customer success should have that fear and be a guardian of of their, their orgs. Um, you know, there is some sales components in customer success. There's no denying that, you know, we need to be constantly looking at our portfolios and understanding what is providing them value. And is there anything else that we currently have in our product suite that could provide them more value? Because again, land and expand, it's almost, you know, table stakes for every SaaS company. So it, there is a sales motion, I think, and every CS leader needs to be a guardian of their team and figure out how can you, how can you complete that sales motion without turning your team into sales people, you know, and it's hard sometimes, especially if we have goals that are aligned around numbers. Um, which most of us do. So yes, this is something I am fearful of uh, at every organization I go into. And I'm a big guardian of trying to make sure that doesn't happen. If I see that we're slipping a little bit too far over here, um, I try to reel it back in immediately. But isn't isn't this a point that I I hear? I mean, I, I think I'm hearing all the time from people how customer success ought to be more like sales. In fact, I hear that. I'm I'm pretty sure I hear that every single week, or read it on on social media every single week. Is you got to be more like so if you want to be taken seriously. It often comes with that in front. If you want to be taken seriously, you have to be more like so. It's it's almost almost like a prayer, or like a like it's a 
it just comes out it just trips out without necessarily any any deep thinking behind it but it's it's like an ism a, a, a catechism of customer success i hear it all the time is it only me or am i am i the no, only no. This? well I, I think i think what what is usually meant is, is that they want to be taken as seriously or as or as thought of as in the same kind of regard a sale and that's a that's a fair statement i think because it's like if the consensus is that customer success isn't seen in the same kind of level mm -hmm. as sales um you know I, i'm not afraid of customer success being turned into sales because i don't see it as it needs to be seen as sales they don't need, they need to be seen as sales people i think miranda i understand the concern and and that's a really valid one actually um uh, I think I subscribe more to what Jeff's saying, but I think the two are not dissimilar. I think I think what you're saying is the same thing. If the right kind of structures in place and the right set of clear expectations are aligned with what the executive's goals are, the customer success should not be afraid of having conversations, expansion conversations, especially if you have confidence in what you've delivered and you and you have this, these value proofs. Why wouldn't, I mean, I, I've been in that position where I've said, okay, you know, we've done, we've accomplished these projects. You guys have achieved what you've said your goals are. Let's talk about what more we can do to help you here. That's an expansion conversation. That's easy to have. And, and I think a lot of CSMs have this kind of mental block. And I think maybe it'll come to a point where we start understanding the role profile needs to kind of shift a little bit to have people in those positions who aren't afraid of having those conversations, but will not be salespeople in the sense of doing the contracts. I think there is a special skill required to do that. And I think Jeff, you kind of touched on that. And I, I don't know if it'll ever come to a point where CSMs, the power of a CSM profile, the people who are good at those things would war really want to be on that kind of contractual. I wouldn't. So that's not to say I represent everybody, but, but I think. Then, you know, you could argue that salespeople also, you know, arguably a lot of the sales team are not necessarily negotiators or sort of, you know, yeah. legal contract or whatever. You know, you know, I see it completely differently. I, I, yet the same, right? I, I, it, what I mean is that um, I think what's changed is not like the sales team and, and customer success have kind of stayed the same. What's changed is the world. So from my perspective, I think what is sales is now different because the world has changed. And I think that, that is what we're struggling to work out now is who does the selling in a world where the selling is not the same thing as the selling that used to happen. And it's a, so it's no longer what we think of as sales. It's something else. And it's more around partnering with our customers. Yeah, and I, feeling on that. I think that Peter is right that we're all kind of saying the same thing. And I agree. A customer success, if they're truly doing their job and they've built that relationship, they understand the needs of the customer and they can kind of map out, you know, maybe through a customer maturity matrix of like, what's next? What, what problems are you solving for that our products can help you with? And they come right. in as a partner and not somebody who is viewed as sailing or right. sales sailing, selling. <laughs> um, so I agree with you, Peter, and I'm not against that. I think that is a core part of what we should do. Um, but I think it's also an art and you have to understand when do you hand it over to an account executive or account manager to where the customer doesn't view you as somebody who's trying to sell to them, um, I think is, is crucial. Just understanding when, the when, when do you, when do you pass that over? And I think Miranda, you're also we're, we're saying, and I agree with you, is that if the senior executives put these expectations of uh, a number for see for customer success to hit, and if they're not built that way, that's that's a setup for failure. I think. 100%. Yeah, absolutely. And as I said, I mean, it's, to me, what what what's changed is that where we used to be a supplier and a customer, we're now a business partner with a business partner. And where we were focusing on, if I, I'll sell you this product for this revenue, instead we're saying, let's work together to achieve this value for this customer's customer, then it becomes a very, very different conversation. So this perhaps brings us to our uh, fourth point on, on the slide here and moving nicely also perhaps into the fifth, if we can encompass them, them both, that would be great. If CS is successful in driving strong NR, RR, in other words, if we're doing lots of like upselling and cross-selling to our existing customers, so we're doing a lot of that stuff, 
how does the relationship change potentially between ourselves and our customers and do we remain as customer centric if that's what we're doing thoughts I'll, I'll try and i'll try and respond quickly uh, to this and i think i think this is a natural kind of bleed in from the previous questions and i think I, the way i see it is uh, you can remain customer centric uh, and it actually demonstrate in a bigger way if you're good at proving value um, and and really having um, you know, equipping the, the the customer with the kind of the language and the knowledge that they've already succeeded in some of their goals and 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 it would be better for them actually and, es and especially coming from a customer success manager who's demonstrated kind of credibility and maybe established a strong level of trust to have that conversation that would be a way for the the, the conversation and the partnership to expand and and also the, then to demonstrate in a bigger way a real authentic way customer centricity because you you've you've already we've heard you we've proved uh, what we can do for you to to achieve your business goals we're making an impact trust us we can do even more here and and we're, and we're going to continue to do more because we're listening to you and paying attention to you I, I Peter summed it up super well I think you know, the customer success, your goal is, is to help them achieve a return on their investment. But what I tell my team is make them look like the heroes at their company. And, you know, the more you make your partner at your, you know, at the, at the customer level, look like a hero, the more they're going to trust you and work with you to continue to leverage more products, more use cases to do this again and again and again. It's super simple. And it's very customer centric. If you think about it, you're putting yourself in your customer's shoes. What are they trying to solve? What does their day look like? How are they using my tools to, you know, save time, create efficiencies, whatever their goals are. And then you're helping them do that again with more of your tools or across more departments, more teams. Okay, great. Thank you. So uh, beautifully put Miranda, fantastically put Peter. I, I totally agree with both of you. Uh, I think the last thing I would just add is that, you know, I think we've, we've talked a lot about customer success and, and driving NRR, but I also see that as a really a company-wide metric, right? If NRR is being accomplished, then that means product is, is doing the right things, that we've sold the right deals. Customer success is, is uh, a champion for NRR, but also I think just that last question and kind of, you know, what Peter and Miranda mentioned, I think is making sure that it's not seen as something that's solely on the plate yeah. of customer success. It really, there's great other point. things that kind of fold in. Yeah, it's a team game, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, great point. Okay, which leads us very nicely into our final little section, in fact, Jeff, which is NRR and sort of the wider corporate strategy. So let's let's talk about that. We've got uh, what we've got about 13 minutes or something like that, I'm guessing. So is NRR the holy grail that customer success has always uh, searched for? Um, and does this give us our route into being taken seriously in the C-suite? So who would like to take that one on first? Uh, Peter, do you want to have a go? Sure. I, um, I guess in a sense, it, it can be seen as the holy grail, but not in the sense of like a chalice as a single kind of um, very visual goal that is easy to understand and easy to, to kind of grasp and run with. I mean, <laughs> it's not. NRR opens up. Uh, it's like, a, I just, like we've said it a few times, it's like an opportunity. It create, creates opportunities. And I think if we focus on NRR, um, it opens, uh, it expands the conversation internally um, to a lot of areas of the business. And, and Jeff, I, I'm so glad you brought up the, the term product because product is too often left on the margins of customer success conversations. I think it needs to be brought into the center of it more frequently. And what I mean by products is not just the physical product or the virtual product, but the actual teams, the product teams. Um, because of the work they do is so critically important for the future of the company, of course, that they need to be involved in this conversation of, of that customer success has around the customer. Uh, and, and I think together, the organizations um, collectively um, reviewing the way they operate, both as, as individual kind of organizations, but also as seamless kind of like woven organizations, that's the holy grail, I think, ultimately, is, is, is if you have NRR seen as the way to kind of drive improvements um, throughout the company. That's that's a, that's holy grail. Yeah, because I think um, it was Jeff who said quite early on in our conversation that you could look at NRR as being a lagging indicator. It, it's showing what you have done rather than you know what what's to come. 
and as such obviously it, it's very valuable evidence to take to the c-suite right it is it is proof positive rather than it is you know a, a projection into the future where we're hoping that x is going to happen so in that sense i think actually it is a great uh, statistic to talk to the c-suite about because it is it is actual you know real evidence uh the of, of of value returns to the business alongside as we said the actual financial figures because as as, as i likened it to it's it's like yeah, yeah it doesn't include the velocity it it, it only in, includes the direction of travel which could be really really grudgingly slow if you're not careful so so we need to also include some velocity figures in there but i think i think it is very helpful um when we're when we're talking to the c-suite i think very very commonly you know, everybody does it whenever they talk to ev everyone we say the same thing to our teams right we tell them to go out and talk in the language of the customer to the customer and we've got to remember as as leaders that when we then go and talk to the c-suite that we're talking <laughs> sorry my computer around they're getting excited that we we equally we talk to the in the language of, of the investor when we're talking to investors and and effectively if we're talking to the cfo that is our investor you know they they, they have invested a budget in keeping the lights on in customer success and it's a significant one and 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 they have they have a rod on their back and we've got to recognize that i think is that they actually have it's not like to even just because they own the business doesn't mean they can do what they like yeah <laughs> okay so so they may be an owner of the business but they've they've still got a lot of challenges that they need to face and they've got to make some very difficult financial decisions and we want to try and make it as easy as possible for them to make the type of financial decision that is going to be helpful and we believe you know helpful to us but best for the company as well and to do that we need to convert our language into into their universal language of you know of, of financial value so that they can compare apples with apples and i think that this is something that we all need to do better at because we need to do it when we're talking upwards but so downwards and outwards to the customer we also need to be training our csms to be better at doing this because it may be a business case up to our cfo well that's exactly the same as as a, as a business proposal out to a customer i think that the seed suite term is very broad though i just want to quickly call that out so you, you touched upon something that I thought was very clever, and it's this, this premise of internal customers, right? So you have to think about who are your internal customers and what do they care about and why should they care about NRR? I think there might be a little bit of education there that could be potentially required for, let's say, a CMO or, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a chief sales officer. Why do they care about NRR? How do they impact that? you know, making sure that we're bringing in the right fit customers that we're, we don't have a leaky bucket of churn, right? Or chief marketing officers, why do they care about NR and how do they impact that, right? So think about your internal customers and how that number impacts their immediate area and how to get them behind that. It's not as, I don't think it's as simple as saying this is our NRR, it's good or it's bad. It's like, there's a lot that goes into it. So who ultimately owns the customer in a world where NRR is the most important value? And let's also add to this, this final question, is it NRR or perhaps is it something like customer lifetime value that we ought to be chasing? Or indeed, is, is it something else that we ought to be worrying about more than either of those things? Uh, any final thoughts uh, from each of you on, on this? So who ultimately owns the customer in a world where NRR is the most important value is actually the entire company. Um, I know that sounds, you know, very fluffy probably, but everybody owns a piece of the NRR measurement, right? It doesn't just sit in customer success. Kind of like I just said, you know, at the C-suite level, you have to think about your internal customers and how each of those individuals impact that. Um, now it may be the ownership of the customer success leader to help educate and to bring everyone along and make sure that that information is being fed to the right individuals. But ultimately, everybody, even down to product and engineering, they own this number. Um, if you, you know, accidentally introduce a bug that creates churn, is that you know, is that the responsibility of customer success? No, it's a responsibility of everyone, right? So that's my thoughts on that. And then NRR is, as Jeff said, very much so a lagging indicator. 
customer lifetime value, increasing customer lifetime value is very much so a more long-term vision of where you need or want your customer base to go. I think watching your NRR is a great indicator of where you're going on the journey in your customer lifetime value. So we've turned, we've turned NRR into a leading indicator of CLV. Absolutely. Great point, Miranda. And I think that that leaves us nicely into our wrap up. So uh, just any any literally just 30 seconds each, any final conclusions or thoughts uh, from, from each of us? And we might as well do it in the order that we're displayed here. So we will we will pick on you on, on this occasion first, Miranda. Yeah. So quick thought, if you are and I'm coming at this from a, st- a small startup viewpoint, if you're not tracking NRR, start tracking it now. Start looking into the data and the story that it will tell you and where you should be investing. Jeff. Yeah, I'll uh, piggyback on, on that one, too. Right. Uh, know the numbers inside and out. So if you if you are measuring NRR, the best thing you, you can do internally is to make sure that you're answering the question of, of kind of why. Right. So. Um, if churn's happening, why is the churn happening? If down, downgrades are happening, why is that happening? If upsells are like continually asking yourself the why so that you can uh, make sure and uncover those and, and be tell, telling that story internally. I think that's an underlying element that Peter mentioned earlier is that storytelling really becomes a part of that leadership uh, angle that you, you have. Thank you so much. Peter? Yeah, I think I just added a historical kind of angle to this. And that is, if you've been in this business long enough, customer success, this is a really gratifying moment that NRR is kind of taking towards center stage because it, it it's a demonstration or a piece of proof that customer success is being taken a lot more seriously now that that this kind of a metric is becoming so important of, of an element of the conversation about how it's impacting not just the business of the vendor but uh the, the customers themselves yeah and i would i would second what the, what the three of you have said uh, absolutely nothing particularly to add except to go back to what Miranda said in the in the previous slide there about you know how how that relationship is changing and how important it is so just to finish then saying thank you so much to everyone who's been listening in and watching and also thank you to Matchbox Virtual for making this possible on the technical side and of course thank you to CS4 Rev for organizing all of this and letting us focus I think on something so important uh, dear to all our hearts which is you know to make customer success as important as it needs to be we need to start focusing more and more on the revenues so so for me thank you very much indeed it's been great 